We're talking about the Cadvent, Cadvent, Advent candle. Cadvent, I might as well just roll with it. <laughs> the Advent candle of love. Love. And this is one that could go so many different ways in a message between 25 and 35 minute window on a Sunday morning. Some of you are like, yeah, but sometimes you preach 40. So no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that today. Appreciate it, appreciate it, appreciate it. But, but there's so many different ways you can go. And so part of where I was preparing this last week was just, okay, God, specifically for us today, for what you're doing in our hearts and in our church, where do you want us to lean into you uh, when it comes to this, the, the Advent candle and the Advent day of, of love and the concept of pressing into this? And um, there's, in the four Gospels, John's account of Jesus and what he experienced walking with Jesus uh, is is such a unique lens, and partly because John communicates through his gospels that he was the disciple whom Jesus loved, and so there's there's this, you know, if, I mean, at least part of how I process it is like you know, he's either like really full of himself, got a lot of pride, like look at me, Jesus, like Jesus really loved me so much so that I want to let y'all know when I wrote this down for you to read, or or he really understood the lens of how he was looked at because of Jesus' love for him in a way that was deep within his DNA. And so he, he wrote it out of a place of, I, I know how loved I am by Jesus. And, and so that's how I begin to see it. You know, when we read through the Gospel of John, it's more through the, a, a man who really understands that he's loved by Jesus. And when I thought about the message today, the thing that the Holy Spirit really impressed on my heart the most, reading through the scriptures and getting into it, what did he want to say? Is that the biggest issue that I think you wanted to address is where the church is at in their understanding and receiving of God's love for them. That there's a significant breakdown. There's a significant gap of understanding of of, a, of a most of our understandings of God's love for us. For still a lot of us, it's very, it's very concept, it's conceptual. It's this idea, it's a philosophy, it's, a, it's out there and it's collective, like it's love for the people of God and I'm a part of the people, which is true. Christianity isn't just individualized, compartmentalized in this little package of it's all about me and God's love for me. And no, you are a part of a family. You are part of the people of God. And so there's, there's, a, there's a group identity to the people of God that is part, partly how we are to interpret scripture as well. But I, the more I talk to people and the more I listen to people talk to me, I recognize one of our greatest issues in life is that we are missing it. We're not grasping it. We have a broken disconnect of fully understanding how much and what it really means that God loves you. And here's how I can, I can say that. Here's partly why I can say that. When somebody really understands how loved they are, it's evidenced through how they love others. When you really know how loved you are, your ability and capacity to love the unlovable increases. And what I'm watching happening around the church in the world, but it's within the church as well, is it seems to be like our capacities to love the unlovable are getting smaller. Our capacities to love those that, that we disagree with is shrinking. The divide between what I'm willing to do, the lengths I'm willing to go to love somebody who I disagree with on a fundamental level politically, uh, philosophically, or whatever, is getting less and less and less. Like, I'm not willing to go as far as I maybe once was because you are who you are. You're making decisions that you're making. You believe things that you believe. And you're over there, and I'm over here. You're them, and I'm me, and us, and we are. I'm just watching the capacity of the people of God to love the unlovable get smaller. That's not everywhere. That's not everyone, so I want to be clear. I'm making a, a generalized statement, but just in my, in my observations. And then if I'm being honest with you, in my own heart, it has been challenging in recent years because of the pressure cooker of life and a global pandemic and so many other things that have come with that, 
where our world has kind of got smaller, our, our desire to protect our people got, got stronger, whether it was ourselves or our families, like everything just got, whether, whatever it was, protect them from the physical stuff that's out there, protect them from the political stuff that's out there, protect them from the mentalities that are out there, all of this stuff. If just for the last two and a half years, I don't know if you've noticed, but it's like we've gotten smaller to, to preserve and protect the stuff that matters to us because it seems like there's, there's just a, a growing sense of attack or division. And so when people, when people lean in to preserve and protect, which is all very, I think, very good. I think there's a lot of stewardship stuff to that when it comes to parents, when it comes to people and families. But at times, if we're not careful, what happens is that same thing that brings us in closer to protect and preserve can create a barrier for everything else on the outside of that circle that isn't agree or it does not look like what we've protected and preserved. And so it can very easily become them, the outsiders, the enemy, and our love for anybody that fits those categories just begins to, to disappear. Today's message is not just a love your enemies kind of message, although I think that that's a great thread of the gospel we see and we see in Jesus' life throughout the four gospels. But it's, it's more a message of when was the last time slash have you really experienced God's love for you? Like for your life, for you as a person, for you as a son or a daughter of God, God's love for you. How and when was the last time you really experienced God's love for you? I, I just know when we experience God's love for us and we experience what it means, it does something to it. It, it begins to erase some of those things that we put up around people in our lives because we recognize that like, I didn't deserve this. I don't, oh, I don't earn this. I'm unworthy of this, and yet God still loves me, and it produces in me a greater capacity to then let that love that's being deposited in me that I didn't earn or work for or deserve flow out of me towards the people around me who make me angry, frustrate me, annoy me, have let me down, have failed me, have hurt me, etc. So the, the premise of today is, is really around receiving God's love afresh for us, so that it can flow out of us. And I want to take us to John's writing in the very beginning of his gospel, John chapter one. We'll, be, we'll read all the way through one through 18. And I have the NLT translation today. It'll be on the screen uh, with me. John one, one through 18. Here's what, here's what John says about Jesus. In the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. Let that sit for a second. The darkness can never extinguish it. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. John testified about him when he shouted to the crowds, this is the one who I was talking about when I said someone's coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. From his abundance, we've all received one gracious blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. 
No one has ever seen God, but the unique one who is himself God is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. Father, speak to us through your word this morning. Help us see and hear what you want us to see and hear and encourage our hearts, challenge our hearts. We wanna be closer to you and look more like you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have you ever tried to imagine what, what God is really like when you think about when you think about a personal relationship with him, like how, how you see, have you seen God and experienced God in your own personal life? I think about G, John making it so clear through what we just read that Jesus has revealed God to us. That was part of the entire thing that happened from manger to cross to ascension is that Jesus is a, a revealing part of who God is. And if you wanna know what God is like, then we need to look at Jesus Jesus is the one that gives us that greatest window. And John specifically is mentioning multiple times throughout that first part of John chapter one that Jesus was full of God's unfailing love and faithfulness. There's this word that I wanna break down that some of you might be familiar with, uh, but it's, it's a word that I think will really help us frame around the, the love I wanna talk about today. And it's the word hased, a hased kind of love. And hased is, and here's kind of the definition breakdown. It's steadfast unyielding covenant love that does not forget or give up. Steadfast, unyielding covenant love that does not forget or give up. This love remembers the covenant of blessing long after the covenant partner has forgotten. To say that God's love is loyal is not to say enough. It goes beyond loyalty, beyond expectation, beyond obligation. God's love remembers us when we have forgotten God. Has said love. Like this is the game changer. This is what sets everything else apart in the world of religion or different things that they would offer as solutions for purpose or whatever. Jesus, this love that Jesus made, uh, made, put on display for us in coming as a baby, living a perfect life as a man, and then dying a brutal death on the cross, victoriously rising from the dead and ascending, is a said love. It's a love that doesn't give up. It's a love that when somebody else doesn't keep their end of the deal, it's still there. When they've broken a commitment, when they've broken a covenant, when they've failed to meet an expectation, it's a love that, that, who, that, love, is, and that love is uncommon. That love isn't really uh, active or evident in most of the relationships that I'm around and I'm, I'm in, in a part of. Well, well, we're human, so we have a lot of factors to that, but I'm, there's something about that kind of love that seems radical and also seems a little bit unobtainable. And yet, it's the love that Jesus demonstrated for us when he lived. And it's the kind of love that I wanna press into today that I want us to see is how God really does love us and you today. So telling a little bit of the story of God's love really is telling the story of Jesus. A couple little highlights from Jesus today as we, as we go to the Advent candle table. Relighting the candle of hope. Relighting the candle of peace. No peace. And lighting the candle of love today. We'll wrap up next week. The candle of joy. Which as I'm rediscovering Advent, uh, apparently, joy is a pink candle. There's some symbolism to that we'll talk about next week. Hope, peace, love. So telling the story of God's love is really telling the story of Jesus. A couple highlights, okay? Some of you will be familiar with this. I won't press into the scriptures a ton, but I wanna say them so that if you wanna press into them later, Matthew 19, 13 through 14, Jesus shows his love for children, for the little children. He's teaching and there's children around. I was watching my son and the kids that joined us for worship today. <laughs> and, um, and uh, you know, as a, so I'm a, I'm a pastor, right? Yeah. One of, one of Holly and I's greatest um, hesitancies uh, to, to, to say yes to this assignment God called us to, to lead Living Water Lacey, to be, to be campus pastors or lead pastors, 
was the fear of what ministry can do to a family. I've watched a lot of pastors, families fall apart, pastors that just do their very best, and they don't even really realize it, but they, their families get sacrificed on the altar of ministry, and, and by the end of their time ministering, either they're burnt out, their family's burnt out, whatever, and not all of that is, is on a pastor or on a parent, not the fault if your kid does not love the Lord or move, none of that is all on them or even uh, partly, it could be lots of factors, but I just, if I was honest, Holly and I were like, we don't wanna do that, we don't wanna risk that, uh, but the Lord really spoke to us uh, and, and kind of settled our fears and concerns around, you just continue to pursue me, keep your eyes on me first and foremost. And then as you do that, keep your eyes on your kids and then the church and I'll take care of the church and I'll take care of your family. So we, we felt like that was clear enough to say yes and to step out in faith. But one of the tensions still in the, in the meantime is how to like, you know, like I'm watching my son over here who's being a, uh, not a great example to the rest of the kids because he's like monkey swinging from the pole there as worship is happening this morning a little bit. And there's this piece of me that's like watching, I'm worshiping and I'm watching him, but I want to be like, no, that's not what we do. That's not who we are. Like, you're going to be a bad example to the kids and to the church. And they're going to look over at my kid and be like, what, why are you letting your kid hang from the bars in church? Don't you have your kids in order, Pastor Chase? The answer is no, I don't. <laughs> they're crazy. I need help. <laughs> Holly, Holly needs help. She's the champion. But I had this moment where the Lord was reminding me of that word to love him first and love my kids. And that I want to create an environment where the, there's more grace than, than the legalism. So, I'm, I, you know, I, I want him to see he can be okay here and figure out a little bit of that stuff. And if he's hanging on the bars for a little bit, like, I'm not going to run over in the fear of what are people going to think. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let it kind of run its course. And it was just a moment where the Lord was reminding me about how he's called me to love him, but love, love my children. Jesus had a heart for that kind of stuff that just completely didn't make sense to all the religious people around him. The, the, the kids that were brought in Matthew 19 were a distraction. They, were, they, were, they did not fit in that environment where all the adults were. And they were to be, you know, an afterthought. It wasn't their place. But Jesus saw them and said, no, 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 no. Don't push them away. Let, let, bring the children to me. Bring them to me. Let them, and then let me get close to the point where they were sitting even on his lap. And he, and he began to bless and pray for them. And, and the disciples even, Jesus' close people, began to rebuke, right? And he's like, stop. This is not the heart, my heart or my point. He, he prioritized them. And I think that what I see in Jesus as we're listening about the story of God through Jesus, the story of God's love through Jesus is that Jesus prioritized these children and, and he brings them close. And what, what does Jesus say? He, he, says, he says in that scripture, uh, he says basically that this is the more important thing. And the important thing that I want you to hear today when it comes to you in your life is that Jesus sees you in the same way he sees a young child. It's not just how we are to treat young children and prioritize loving them and creating space for them in the faith or the family of God, but it's also to see there are some people who feel like their very presence is a, uh, is a hindrance to somebody, is, a, uh, is, a, is an annoyance you're not smart enough, you're not talented enough, you're not successful enough, you're not, and so what your relationships have created, maybe even the ones that are closest to you, maybe even your marriage, maybe in your, your family relationship or a, a boss and, and coworker situation where you feel like you aren't enough to be able to be seen by somebody and loved and valued and appreciated and have purpose. And I wanted, I just paralleling this point, Jesus looked at the insignificant, the ones that couldn't offer anything and he said, no, they're, they're a priority to me. I wanna bring them close. I see them, I bless them, I pray for them. And so if you've been in any of those places, part of how you need to see God's loving you differently than the world is that in what the world will say, you're insignificant, you're annoying, you're, you're not enough. Jesus is saying, uh -uh, all of that's false. I see you differently. Come close to me and let me bless you. Let me, let me impact your life. Did you experience when you were a kid knowing how important and valuable you were? I recognize that as I get closer to Jesus and go on a healing journey of my own life and heart, it's just a lot of stuff I recognize that is in our past and our upbringings that really still impact us today. 
you're not a kid now, but maybe you're still a kid emotionally in some places. Did, did, did you experience getting seen like that when you were a kid, loved like that when you were a kid? Because if you didn't, you're in a group of a lot of people who would say, that's me. But today, Jesus wants you to know he sees you and he loves you and he wants to heal that hurt, woundedness, brokenness that you might have from your upbringing, from a lack of love from your parents or from your guardians or whatever relationship created maybe that disconnect. Jesus can heal and restore and redeem that. He wants to heal and fill that void today. So prioritize his children. The other thing we see about Jesus is this moment where he heals a woman with the issue of blood out of Luke 8, 43 through 48. So Luke 8, 43, 48, the woman who's had the issue of blood for years, 12 years or so of pain, of discomfort, of inconvenience. Jesus is walking through the crowd of people on the streets on his way to some ministry and local leaders are all there. He's on his way to go heal someone's daughter who's dying. And as the crowds are kind of pressing in on him, there's this woman who's had a bleeding issue for 12 years and she has heard about Jesus and she knows there's a potential. If she could just get around him, she could get healed because he'd been healing people. There was just something different about Jesus. And this woman was like, I'm in, I gotta figure it out. And again, culturally, didn't do that. A woman who had an issue of bleeding was outcast. She was, don't go around people. It went for years, no relationships that really were, were probably that close. A lot of like, you're an inconvenience, you're unclean, you're, no one likes you or wants to be around you because you have an issue that can't get healed. I mean, this identity of this woman is just in the absolute dumps of humanity. And yet she recognizes there's something about Jesus that could touch and heal her if she can get close to him. The religious leaders, even more so, I, I didn't know this until I was studying this last week, that the, the religious leaders of the day, beyond just the cultural understanding of what people thought about women, uh, about women with bleeding issues or people with bleeding issues like this, that it was unclean or whatever, but religious leaders took it to another level, which I just oh, frustrates me, but also, Lord, help me see my, myself to never be like this. Religious leaders would look at that as unclean, but also as her fault with that kind of situation and issue. So it wasn't even just something she had no control over. It was deemed that you did something in this arena that created this issue. So there was even a, a darker mark on her from that, cut off from community. But she was desperate. If I could just touch his robe, I might be healed. So she does. She breaks through the crowd somehow, some way, touches the hem of Jesus' robe. And Jesus, the, the scriptures say he felt power go out from him. I just love that. I love that. I love the sensitivity. All of the people touching God as he's walking. Jesus is walking. It's got to be all kinds of hands and elbows and arms and, you know, things bumping his. I mean, it's not like he had this clear walking path and this person came out of the. It was like in, around people. So he's feeling people touch him the whole walk. Something was different about this woman's desperation to get close to Jesus that when he, she touched the hem of his robe, power went out from him and she healed. He healed this woman instantly. And he says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. She's healed. And what I want us to see today is that that love, the love that Jesus demonstrates in this moment, it reinstates dignity and worth to the human soul. The love of God demonstrated through Jesus reinstates dignity and worth to the human soul. There's a lot of in front of us in the day-to-day, -day, in the world that we live in, that is, whether we realize it or not, constantly trying to erode our worth, the worth of the human soul, our dignity. And again, if, if you hurt people, hurt people. So if you are, uh, if you had an upbringing with a mom or a dad or a dad or a mom or some situation that was uh, unloving, hurtful, abusive, like most often, almost 100% of the time, however that happened, is somewhat of a byproduct of something that they experienced in their family before from their parents and so forth and so forth. And so hurt, hurt people hurt people. And part of how people hurt other people is to help make them feel less than so they can feel better than. And that creates that sense of, of making somebody feel unworthy or to take the dignity away. And Jesus' love reinstates dignity and worth to the human soul. 
And so some of you that might be sitting here today still wrestling through wounds and hurts from, from the past, things that people have said, the, the, the love that God wants, to experience, wants you to experience afresh even today is a love that reinstates dignity to your heart, to your soul, worth to your identity. Because I'm sure there's people in here that have been demoralized, have felt small and unworthy, less than, but the love of Jesus reveals to you your worth in his eyes. I mean, that woman that had that issue was so not on the category of people that would have been the right person to heal or have a performed miracle. It was just Jesus. That's Jesus. That's who he is. That's who is, that's who came. As a boy, little baby, became a boy, became a man, died for you and I, who we still sing songs to because he, he didn't stay dead. He resurrected from the grave and ascended to heaven victoriously, and he's still king of kings and lord of lords, and we, we sing songs. We still have a relationship today in 2022 with Jesus. That Jesus is still giving out dignity and restoring it and bringing back worth to the human soul. Maybe he wants to bring back worth to your soul today because there's some people walking around life with a wounded soul feeling unworthy and like they don't have anything lovable. Jesus wants to reinstate dignity and worth to your soul. A couple more, Zacchaeus, Luke 19, one through 10. I have a, I have a couple Zacchaeus messages that I, I, just, I just love and I wanna do a whole series one day on it because I think there's so much than just a message, but just to highlight, because I can't get around thinking about how Jesus shows his love to, to people that doesn't necessarily make sense to without talking about Zacchaeus. This guy, again, little man syndrome, you know what I mean? It's like, didn't necessarily get the DNA from you know, his dad or mom that allowed him to be the average height of whatever a you know, man back in the day was. I resonate, okay? I resonate with Zacchaeus. I feel like we're brothers. Tall heart. All heart. But Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He wasn't liked by a lot of people. He was kind of a, a dirt bag in a lot of ways. He, 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 he conned people out of their money. He took more off the top as a tax collector than, than he should have, and people knew it. And uh, he didn't have a lot of relationships, and partly we know that because of the way that people responded at this moment. So he, again, Jesus is moving, walking through this crowd of people, and Zacchaeus hears about this guy. He's small, so we can't see him, and he doesn't really want people to really see him anyway because he knows how people don't like him, but he gets himself up a tree, so he's high enough to see Jesus as he's coming in. And, and so here he is. Jesus is walking. He identifies Zacchaeus up in the tree, calls him by his name. Come on down comes down, I'm gonna eat at your house today. Goes to Zacchaeus' house, Zacchaeus is trying to get everything all cleaned up and you know, Jesus, I'm gonna fix my life, I'm gonna make it all clean, I'm gonna give people back. And all of this stuff happens in this moment, but, but the point that we see Jesus really press into is that Jesus seeks the outsider. Love seeks the outsider. The, love doesn't just wait for the outsider to come to him. As he's moving and he sees him off in the tree, he, he, Zacchaeus wasn't calling his name, different than the story we just, read, we just mentioned before with the woman who had the bleeding issue who ran and found Jesus, touched his, his robe. Jesus is got to be intentional in this moment about seeing Zacchaeus far off and then calling him to himself. He seeks the outside. Love seeks the outsider. And, and so opposite of what a rabbi would be expected to do back in that day because rabbis didn't seek anyone out. That was the opposite. Everybody else sought out the rabbi. There was no, there was no rabbi going to find somebody else out because it was so, un, that was the opposite of the culture and the system. He, and, he, and on top of that, he wasn't even a guy worth seeking. He wasn't good. He was a bad dude. He was a cheater. He, he, he didn't just make mistakes unbeknownst to himself. He made intentional mistakes and hurtful things, and yet Jesus seeks him. That doesn't make sense. I mean, it does, it does, like, when we think about the Bible, think about your life. Think about you. How, how hard it maybe has been in moments or even is now when you know how much you've messed up, how much you've failed, how much you've broken a decision 
or a discipline or you've stepped back into an addiction or a habit or you've, you're wrestling with some kind of thing that's like, I don't even deserve, I don't deserve. Jesus seeks the outsider. Love seeks the outsider in a way that helps communicate, I love you and you belong to me. He welcomes him into his inner circle, that proximity of closeness to come into his house and have that meal with him. Final one. And then I wanna cue up a video of a song that has ministered to my heart and soul in this last season around God's love. But last, last point of Jesus is that at John 8, one through 20, it's, it's the woman uh, that was caught in adultery. John 8, one through 20. And th- so this is the moment where Jesus is teaching in the temple. So like, imagine church here. And I got some, you know, outside ministry leaders kind of hanging around out in the lobby, maybe in the parking lot. So Jesus is teaching in the temple and a bunch of religious leaders, the Pharisees, drag in a woman that was caught in the act of adultery. And they basically, what do you think we should do with her? You know, wanting to kind of put Jesus to the test, right? Like this, we know what the scriptures from the Old Testament, the law says that we need to do to punish this act of grotesque, uh, sin that was evident. It's been, we're caught red-handed. There's no like wondering. It's like, here's the verdict. It's guilty. And, you know, so what do we, what do you think we should do, Jesus? They know what they, we should do, but they want to know what Jesus has to say. So they're kind of questioning him. So Jesus says that moment, comes down, comes out, gets down on the ground in the middle of the road and gets on a knee and then puts a finger around through the sand, draws a line in the sand, the scriptures say, and he says to the religious leaders, whichever one of you's never sinned, Go ahead and throw this, the stone. Throw, be the first one. Like the, one of the greatest mic drop kind of moments in, I think, Jesus' ministry. Because, because, you know, everybody knows what should be done. Everybody is waiting to see how Jesus is going to respond. And he just completely flips it on top of their heads in a way that, you know, again, doesn't, he doesn't come roaring out and, you guys are sinners too. And you should, you know, he just, he just gets, he's quiet. He gets on this level with this woman right where she's at. He, he takes the attention off of her because they're all looking at her and he, he does something that like, what's he doing? He, he's, he's like, look at me. The attention's on me. And then see this, whoever, you can cross this line, whoever's the first one that you never sinned, you could throw the stone. No one can and they know it. They know they can't. And one by one they leave and there's that moment where Jesus communicates to the woman, he restores her. You've been forgiven, now go and sin no more. And, and, and a lot of us in the church, we really want to hear more messages about the go and sin no more. Like we, you know, I hear that a lot. People are like, when, you know, yeah, it's, it's love them. But like, remember Jesus said, go and sin no more. Like, don't forget that, Chase. It's not just love. It's, it's also truth. And there's also conviction. And there's also morals in black and white. And you're right. You're right. But the go and sin no more doesn't transform anybody's heart. The, 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 the attempt to try and be different doesn't, Keep people changed. I do think it's a clear directive from the Lord. I do think that people need to step out of sinful patterns in, in histories. I do think it's, there's more black and white than what some of the churches around the world and maybe the nation are, are preaching. There's, there's more messages around being clear around sin and the fact that, man, sin is death. Jesus died so we didn't have to be bound by it and he wants to heal us and forgive us and we need to be cleansed because of the blood of Jesus, what it's capable of. All of that, I'm in, Un, uh, unashamedly. Because of, the, because of the gospel. But the you forgiven, you've been forgiven part, if you don't really believe that, if you don't really hear that, if you don't really receive that and understand that, your ability to go and sin no more decreases significantly because the love is where the heart change can happen so that the behavior change can flow out of it. We got too many Christians trying to behavioral change, behavior modification in their life to look more like the Bible or to try to do what they think is right. And that's never gonna work. It's never gonna last. You will always find yourself in a sin cycle and a guilt cycle, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, until you have a radical, fresh encounter with the love of God that helps you see yourself the way Jesus sees you, that you can't earn it or deserve it or, or do anything to keep it, 
but he still gives it to you. Why? Why does Jesus love the unlovable? Love does not reject the broken and the sinful. Love does not reject the broken and the sinful. You might be here today broken and sinful. It's not just them, whoever's them. It's us. The day that I get unfamiliar with the love of God for my life, my ministry loses power, my marriage will be impacted, my kids will be impacted, because if you lose touch of a finger, a pulse on how God's still loving you, has loved you, is still loving you, and always will, you're going to miss it. And I think some of us are sitting here today, and the Lord wants us to see in here, I, have, I want you to see this more clearly. And, and not just see, I want, you to, I want you to experience and receive it more clearly today afresh, my love for you. Have you ever wondered if you've gone too far for Jesus to still want you and love you? Can I tell you today, you haven't? But man, the, the enemy really likes to just run that lie in overtime in our hearts and our minds. The scriptures say that if we confess, he's faithful to forgive us and that love will cover our sins. When, he, Jesus, when Jesus does that, go and sin uh, no more to the, the lady as well, just reiterating, that does not diminish the severity of the sin. It, it, it's just that the, the potency of his love is just bigger. <laughs> It doesn't mean that the sin doesn't have consequences. It doesn't mean that the sin shouldn't be taken seriously. It, I, just, I just think it's Jesus has got the order there pretty clearly. Like, I, you are forgiven. You are loved. Period. Experience that. Feel that. Embrace that. Receive that. Now go and sin no more. Jesus' love for us today is in the same category. And I just know in a church, there's still people wrestling with stuff like this. Just because you're here at church and you've been following Jesus maybe for a certain amount of time, I recognize more and more, sometimes it's harder for us to be familiar with God's love because it was that one time. It was at that one moment. And as we follow Jesus or we try to be a good Christian or we lead our families to church or whatever else it might look like, it can become easier to, to be distant from receiving and feeling and experiencing God's love for you. And we gotta come back to that today. I wanna, I wanna play a video of a song to wrap up our time today uh, by a, a guy named Corey Asbury, who um, the, the heart of the song is, is him just really authentically and vulnerably writing a, a, a letter to God and then God writing one back. It's kind of the heart of the song. That's the context. So as you're listening and you're listening or reading the words, you'll know. Um, and then I want to bring us to a point of, of conclusion. But this song has been something that's ministered to me and, uh, and I wanted to minister to you this morning. So take a look and a listen to the song. Dear God, I've been trying awful hard to make you proud of me. But it seems the heart of But if I pray a little harder, 
if I follow the rules, I wonder could I ever be enough? Cause I try and try just to fall back down again. And I ask myself, why do I try to chase the wind? I just lean into the mystery. Maybe hope is found in melody. It's a beautiful picture. I remember listening to that the first time. And um, I was just, I was weeping as a part of where I was at in that season. But just to hear the way Corey wrote the Father's Heart writing back, I just, he, he's writing that kind of, he wrote that kind of letter to you back. And I don't know what you're wrestling with today. I know God wants you to receive his love afresh because everything in your life will be healthier the more you understand and receive God's love for you. So I want to pray for you. share just a quick a couple weeks ago there's a moment for Holly and my wife where I had made some mistakes some of them were well they were all my fault but some of them I I had an idea what could happen if I you know and the other ones were out of my control but regardless I made some mistakes and um was wrestling with some of the weight and the guilt of the implications of the mistakes and just how to communicate it to my wife and just fear, insecurity, pride, all of that stuff began to swirl around my mind and heart around assuming how she was going to respond. <clears throat> which begin to pre create this like, so you don't even, it's not even worth having the conversation or trying to, try to talk about it because you know she's gonna just have walls up and you deserve that. You know, you made the mistake. And so it's not even worth pressing into, you know. You don't deserve love or grace here in this way. And uh, I can, the gist of it is this. The Lord helped me overcome my own pride and different things that were creating that lie narrative that I was believing, I really think, from the enemy to try and not have a moment of conversation with her. And 
had a moment of conversation and shared kind of the things that I wanted to share, the weaknesses and the failures that I had experienced. And the way she listened and then the way she like grabbed my face and looked at me and said, hey, I love you. I, I experienced God's love in that moment like I had it in a long time. And God used my wife to help me experience her love because it was a, I don't deserve this response kind of love. It was a um, uncomfortable, I, you should be whatever. You, I, I, know, I know what kind of response I should, I should feel like. And I just, I, my own per, I had a hard time receiving it. You can't do that. You can't love me. You can't, you can't say that right now. You can't even, how can you do this? And it was just this beautiful moment of the Lord giving me a gift of helping me see and experience his love for me through my wife, through an imperfect person, through a fallible human, just as I am. And in that moment of, of, of her grabbing my face and looking me in the eyes, regardless of what I just brought to, you know, that conversation is, is a moment I want you to get in your head for this prayer moment of God looking at you in the face, grabbing your, look at me, look at me. I love you. I love you. And then those, those like shame, guilt, hard to eye contact kind of moment. No, eyes up, look at me, look at me. I love you. My love supersedes all of it. It supersedes all of it. It can wipe away all of it. It can heal and restore and forgive all of it. Again and again. Look at me, look at me. I love you. Now receive my love. So will you close your eyes with me for a moment? Father, just holding your head, a moment of eye contact with a smile. You might sit here today feeling like, I don't have to chase, you don't know, you don't know where I'm at, you don't know what I've been doing, you don't know where I've been, you don't know the secrets I've been trying to keep, you don't know the darkness. That None of that can disqualify you. But Chase, I've had this moment before. I've prayed the prayer of repentance and confession. I've, I've received God's love before. I can't keep doing it. I can't, God's gonna be, it's gonna run out. No, it won't. It can't. It's unfailing. You can't outfail the God's love for you. You can't outsin the love of God for you. And, and when you capture a greater understanding of that love, your heart will be unlocked in different ways to step into a greater lifestyle of health and light and purity and righteousness. Yes. But don't miss this moment to receive it afresh. So Father, I pray right now if my brothers and sisters here, my friends in the room, my family in the room that just need a fresh experience and revelation of your love for them right now in this moment, God, I pray you would deposit the revelation of the truth of your love for us.